has never been there will never be a god like you a love so true there has never been there will never be a god like you a love so Savior, he will stay. 
has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hope my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall Testing, testing. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today, the mercies that I knew, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to, because they can't stay long, when I am here with you, it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. Wow. 
Good morning, church. It is great to see each of you here this morning, and I know others are, are going to come in and join us, but if you're joining us online, I want to say welcome to you as well. Uh, lots of places you could be this morning, and we're excited that you're here uh, to worship with us. And um, there's a lot of things going on at the church this morning, and I want to I want to jump right in. First of all, I want to remind you that following the, the 11 o'clock service today, I want to invite all of you all to um, come out and join us at Buford Park at the Pavilion. Uh, we're having a churchwide picnic uh, and I believe uh, an awesome cornhole tournament as well and just a, a time of fellowship and fun on a, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And so again, please, please come join us. I think it's going to be be a wonderful, wonderful day for us as well. Um, also want to remind you to uh, br- bring a lawn chair if you would like. Uh, we, of course, have all the benches and everything out there, but, but bring a lawn chair. That, that'll be helpful as well. Uh, our Book Buddies program, I mentioned to you, has, is, is about ready to start back up where we go in and read um, at the elementary school that we partner with. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of that, and I hope that you will um, have more questions, ask me. But there are sign-up sheets right outside uh, of the auditorium here, um, and I want to encourage you to, to sign up for that. And again, ask me questions if you have more more, more information needed there. Also, we're going to have uh, we do have one more small group that's going to launch uh, the week of October the 12th. And so uh, there was a registration opportunity for that on the online email on Friday. But uh, if you are interested in that, contact either Lisa Lance or the church office or, or sign up online, and we will make sure that, that you get to be a part of that class as well. The student prayer cards um, that uh, Chuck King was here and told us about where we're praying for a specific student, um, you can pick up your student's card um, down in front of the nursery in the hallway towards the fellowship hall. They're all laid out there with your name on it, so grab that. If you didn't get a chance for, to sign up for that, you can do that right there as well. And lastly, I want to uh, remind you and encourage you, um, we have um, our second discernment meeting this Wednesday at 6 o'clock uh, in the sanctuary. All of our Wednesday night activities um, are postponed for, for that. So again, I hope that you will, you will come join that. It's going to be um, uh, hopefully a very informative meeting for for, for everyone. So, 6 o'clock, there is uh, nursery and child care will be provided that night. Um, but again, hope that you will join us Wednesday night uh, at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary for that. Please see your bulletin for other um, information and uh, grab a, a prayer, 40 day prayer sheet as well um, as we're praying over this time of discernment. Again, thank you for being here. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. This is Communion Sunday. So again, a reminder of that. Uh, There's a gluten-free option as well. If you are not yet comfortable coming through the line, uh, we do have a a few of our self-contained packets uh, remaining. Um, But welcome. Thank you for being here. Let's stand and sing together this morning. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, a Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. 
every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen you will do great things oh god you do great things oh here Your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captain and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance your freedom, awake and alive. Your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great worship a God who does great, great things. So join me as we stand together in one voice and affirm our faith and our affirmation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, you indeed are a God of great things. And God, forgive us when we either, one, take that for granted, or or two, we, we even lose hope and faith in that. But God, that is the truth. When we gather here to worship and to celebrate you, for who you are and all that you are. And God, I know there may be those today here, and if not all here today, Lord, that just need the reaffirmation that you are indeed who you say you are. And you are capable of more than we can, can possibly understand or dream. God, I pray that that's more than than a faith and a knowledge that rolls around in our minds and our heads, Lord, but that we that we truly know and experience that in our hearts. 
that you truly, truly are capable of all things. So God, those who gather here in need of healing, God, you are, you are able and you are the healer. God, for those here this morning who, who need forgiveness and restoration in their life, God, your mercy and your grace are new every morning. God, may we receive your love and forgiveness. God, may we have hearts that offer that love and that mercy and that forgiveness to others as well. God, not only to be your light and your hands and your feet in the world, but Lord, for our own well-being and self. God, we love you. We're here to celebrate you today, and I pray that you are celebrated with our song and our words. God, thank you for your pursuit and love of our hearts. As we celebrate and honor communion today, we, we honor the, the sacrifice that you make for us. And God, again, that's an easy term for us to, to speak of in the church. God, may we truly know the depths of your love and sacrifice for us. And may it draw us to you and bring us hope, restore our souls, and restore the joy and the fullness of life that you sacrificed for us for. God, we join together in one voice the prayer you taught saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together again. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy, oh my days. Yes, I will. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days. Yes, I will for oh, my days. Yes, I will. I choose to pray. Of all names, nothing.
to take up offering and I'd like you to join me in prayer as we do so. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, that you are the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that all the gold and all the silver are yours. So when we come here today, I pray that you would stir our hearts to give. You would help us align with the Lord's prayer, that you would not lead us into the temptation to hold back, to reserve, to clench tightly treasures other than you. So in this day, I pray that um, You'd bless the giver and the receiver. That you'd set our minds and our hearts on the task of growing your church, this great mission for which you've called us out of darkness. Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for the givers in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this day and thank you for our children. We're so grateful. We're grateful for their, their light and how they brighten our world. And we thank you, God, that this day, uh, as, as it happens every Sunday, uh, they get to hear once again about your goodness and your grace and your love and your truth. So we pray that you'll be with our children as they go. And we pray, too, for ourselves, those of us who remain here, that you will uh, bless these next few minutes, prepare us as we move towards communion, help us to hear your word of grace and truth. Help me to say what you want me to say and to say it in a manner that's pleasing to you and helpful to your people. And we entrust it all to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me quickly say a, a word of preface before reading the, uh, the Scripture this morning. I had to kind of adjust the preaching schedule just a little bit because of my um, 
an upcoming anniversary. Now, trust me, I did have my anniversary on my calendar, um, but I didn't know if I'd be able to take off Sunday, but I am going to be off next Sunday. So um, that sort of adjusts the, the preaching text going forward as we work through this series. And also, as I look through the final chapters of the book of Acts, it's pretty clear that um, some of the text, they, they duplicate uh, or they, re, they go over some of the earlier things we've preached about in the book of Acts. I mean, the, the text that I was going to preach on this particular week is an example of that. And so there's a lot of duplication or there's some as they're referencing past events. And I don't want to re-preach a topic or a, a text. And some of the stories, they have a similar vibe as we work through the rest of the, the book. For instance, like when Paul, towards the end of the book, he, he stands in from an, front of a number of councils and courts, and some of what he says sort of overlaps chapter to chapter. And if, if we had all the time in the world, then that would not be an issue. I would just, we would just take it section by section. But I'm committed to landing this plane on November the 13th because the week after that is Thanksgiving Sunday as we prepare for Thanksgiving and then, can you believe it, Advent. So with that in mind, I uh, want to invite you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 22 this morning. Acts 22, we'll have to do a lot of contextual work here, but Acts 22 verses 1 through 21. Acts 22, verses 1 through 21. Brothers and sisters, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew or Aramaic language, they became even more quiet and said, I'm a Jew born of Tarsus in Cilicia and brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus, to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for me to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. 
And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving, watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, have you ever been misunderstood or misrepresented or maligned. Now, that's a huge range. It, it stretches from what a spectrum that is, from something that's totally unintentional to accidental to just very intentional. I guess the answer is that. I, mean, I think all of us have been misunderstood and on, to, on, on one end, and maybe, maybe perhaps just maybe you've experienced being maligned um, at the same time, I think all of us can honestly say, because we're fully human, at times we have misunderstood people and we have misrepresented people and we have maligned people as well, right? I mean, come on, we're human. That's part of the human fall. That's part of the fall. It's part of uh, the makeup of, of who we are as we wrestle as redeemed and yet still people who struggle with what it means to be fallen Something similar happens to the Apostle Paul in this particular story. And it's really important for this story to understand the larger context. So in order to put chapter 22, 1 through 21 in context, you got to hear the whole story, the context. So let's go back to last chapter. Last week, we ended chapter 21 with verse 16. Paul's third and final missionary journey his final leg of his last missionary journey has come to a close. Come to a close. They arrive in Jerusalem. And then chapter 21, verse 17, which was going to kind of be the text for this week, but I've already preached on part of it. Um, th this is how it begins. So when they arrive in Jerusalem, starting in verse 17 of chapter 21, immediately Paul and his companion, which includes Luke, the writer of Acts and others, they seek out and they find James and the other elders in the church of Jerusalem. James is the brother of Jesus, and he was the recognized leader of this um, almost thoroughly Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. And so they seek James and the other Jerusalem elders out, and they begin to share with them uh, what God had been doing among the Gentiles all across the land. And I'm going to stick real close to the text here so I can tell the story as accurately as I can um, uh, and use our time wisely. And so when all of the elders in Jerusalem heard what God had been doing among the Gentiles, the text says they began glorifying God. They began praising God because they were thankful that God was reaching out to the Gentiles. But then there is a concern that James and the elders in Jerusalem share with Paul and Paul's companions. And here it is, and it's in chapter 21, verse 21, and I think the verse will be on the screen. And they, and they there represents the believers in Jerusalem, the Christians in Jerusalem. They've been told about you, and you is Paul. They've been told that you, Paul, teach all the Jews who were among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. In other words, they're like, Paul, this is awesome how God is reaching to the Gentiles. But word has come back to us that you're telling Jewish people that they should not they, 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 shouldn't, they should forsake their heritage. They should forsake the law of Moses. And it, it, we hear that you are telling people that they shouldn't even circumcise their children. Now, it's interesting because they have misunderstood what Paul said in his preaching. And it's an easy misunderstanding. You will remember as Paul toured the Gentile world, he was preaching the gospel. The gospel that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That it is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that saves us from our sins, that redeems us and reconciles us to the Father. That is what saves us, not circumcision, not keeping the law of Moses. It's, it's, it's 
the grace of God when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was not in any way disrespecting his Jewish heritage. He wasn't anti-Moses or anti-circumcision at all. He was simply telling the people it's not circumcision that saves anybody. In fact, in fact, in Acts chapter 16, Paul himself circumcises Timothy. And so when he was talking to the Gentiles, he would say to them, listen, circumcision, the law of Moses, all the Jewish heritage, that's never been part of your culture. Don't even worry about that. Listen, it is we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. When we put our hearts and our lives penitently into Christ, we are saved. And to his Jewish people, he would say the same thing. Uh, We are saved by grace through faith not by circumcision, but in no way was he saying, turn against your heritage, turn against the Jewish upbringing that you have been given. That's what he would say. And when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem heard, heard this, they then recommend Paul do a couple of things. Okay, Paul, everybody's saying that you are anti-Moses, anti-Judaism. Here's what we need you to do, Paul. Paul, we need you to go through, do this. Go through a seven-day period of Jewish purification. Then everybody's going to, if you observe that, everybody's going to know, okay, Paul is not anti-Moses. He's not against Jewish heritage. Paul goes through that particular um, uh, event. But they say to Paul, as for what we said to the Gentiles, that stands, right? Uh, We're saved by grace through faith. But when you come to Christ... Stop doing those practices that look that are more pagan than Christian. And I have a full sermon on that from Acts chapter 15. You can look. So Paul goes through, Paul goes through the whole seven-day period of observation. And then, after going through that seven period of period, seven-day period of observation, we find himself, he finds himself at the temple. And there are certain Jews from Asia. Now, ancient Asia would have been Ephesus. Remember, Paul toured through Ephesus. So, the leaders in Jerusalem say, listen, Paul, people are saying that you're against the law of Moses. Do this. Go through a Jewish ceremony of purification that'll show everybody you're not against the law of Moses. Paul goes through it. Seven days later, Paul is now in the temple. He's now in the temple, and certain Jews, and these are non-Christian Jews, these are just Jews from Asia They see Paul in the temple. And this is what they say in chapter 21, verse 28. Uh, Men of Israel, help this man, Paul, who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has denied this holy place. So pause there. So once again, these allegations are like, listen, this guy has been going around the world telling everybody to turn against their Jewish heritage. And not only that, not only that, it gets worse. He's now defiling this particular temple, this holy place. They had seen Paul in Jerusalem with an Ephesian named Trophimus. They saw Paul somewhere in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile. And they are saying, Paul brought this Gentile, this unclean Gentile, into the inner sanctuary of the temple. Well, Paul did not do that. There's no evidence whatsoever that Paul did that. The way the temple was laid out was that there was the outer court, which was the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could go in there. They could not enter into the inner sanctuary They see Paul in the inner sanctuary. They knew that Paul had been associating with Trophimus in the city somewhere else. And they begin saying, listen, look what Paul did. Paul has brought this Gentile into this holy temple. And according to Mosaic law, if you brought a Gentile into the temple, it was a death sentence. And so once again, Paul is either at best misunderstood or misrepresented but he is definitely, to some degree, maligned. And so I I want us to think about, in the passage that we read today in chapter 22, is Paul's response to this understanding of being maligned, being misrepresented, or being misunderstood. The first point is this, because all of us from time to time, we get misrepresented. Sometimes we misrepresent others. That just happens. It's part of what it means to be human. And so I love, I want to share three thoughts with you, and these aren't long thoughts at all, but how do you respond? How do 
you, I, how, do, how, do, how does anyone respond Christianly when we've been misunderstood, misrepresented, or at worst, maligned? The first is this, find commonality. Find commonality. The text begins, this is Paul's address, and we read it earlier. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I have made before you. He begins as he's standing in front of the people to make his defense with these words of commonality, brothers. He immediately says, listen, I'm not against you. You and I, we are brothers together. We're brothers together. And the word father implies that there are some of the the leaders among the Jewish people there too. Brothers and fathers, I make my defense. And then he begins to speak in the Hebrew language. And your Bible may say Aramaic. That is a dialect of Hebrew. So not only does he address them with words of commonality, we are brothers together. You are my fathers. We have learned from one another. He addresses them in a language that they understand. Aramaic was the common Jewish language of the day. So immediately, he immediately begins on common ground with these people who have misunderstood him. And I think it's a great lesson for us when misunderstood or misrepresented or at worst maligned, let's start by finding commonality, commonality. And I think most of the time, not always, but most of the time, even in the midst of conflict or misunderstanding, there is still some commonality that we can have with one another, right? Right? I mean, at the very least, we can say that we are all created in the image of God, that you, I, we all bear the image of God. And if we all bear the image of God, that demands honor and dignity and respect towards one another. I think many of us, and somebody on our Wednesday night Bible studies, we were studying this text, um, she had this great point. She said, so many of us, when we are facing conflict or difficult situations, we are tempted to either fight, freeze, or flee. Fight, freeze, or flee, right? And that's true, right? Some of us are wired to fight, like bring it on, right? Or bring it on. But others of us freeze. We're like, I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what, to, I, I can't even think about it. Others flee immediately. We are so averse to any kind of conflict. We're like, I'm done, I'm out, see you later. I'm, I'm amazed that Paul, when he is misrepresented or misunderstood, at worst maligned, he doesn't, he, he doesn't do that. He steps into it, but he steps into it with common ground, right? Hey, listen, we are brothers. We are, you are my fathers. We share the same commonality. Have you ever had to find common ground with someone in the midst of conflict? It's not always easy, but, but have you had to do that? I bet you have. I know you have, right? We all have, right? We all have. And second question, is there currently common ground you need to find with someone? How do we deal with being misrepresented, misunderstood, or at worst maligned? Find common ground. Number two, give defense. Give defense. In verses 3 through 21, Paul gives defense for himself. So let's just kind of quickly remind ourselves of what we read together. In verses 3 through 5, He reminds them of his Jewish heritage, his Jewish background, that he he is not anti-Jewish whatsoever. He says, I was born a Jew, born in in Tarsus, which was an educated city of Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated by Gamaliel, who was the famous teacher. He said, I I was raised according to the strict law that, that you yourselves keep. I persecuted the way, that the way is the church. I persecuted the church. And you yourselves can even bear witness to that. And so he begins just this idea, listen, I, I want you to understand, you and I, we have this common background. We are indeed connected. And then he continues his defense, verses 6 through 11. He says, he retells about the encounter he had with Jesus. The encounter, and we study that 
way back in Acts chapter 9. You remember that? He's on the road to Damascus. The Lord Jesus appears to him, knocks him off the horse, bright light, and he's blinded. Remember? And then in verses 12 through 16, we studied that also, he recounts his conversion story. How a man named Ananias was sent to him to be ministered to by the Lord. That's a great story. The Lord says to Ananias, um, there's a man named Saul of Tarsus. He is now in Damascus. You need to go minister to him. And Ananias like, hold up on that one, Lord. I know about that guy. He's the one who's been persecuting the church. Pick somebody else. And the Lord says, no, you've got to go because he's going to be my witness. He's going to be my witness to the world. And Ananias goes, tells Paul, his name was Saul at the time, tells him what the Lord told him. He baptizes him, and um, Paul is uh, Saul, Saul, his name was Saul at the time. He, he, he becomes, I guess you'd say, a, a follower of Christ in that particular moment. And then verses 17 through 21 happens when Paul, after he has talked to Ananias, after he's been baptized, again, he's recounting what happened, Paul returns to Jerusalem. He goes to Jerusalem to, to tell about this new faith that he has encountered. But the Lord says to him in a vision, Saul, Paul, they're never going to accept you. Instead, I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. They know who you are. They've known what you've done. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Back to the original point. Paul starts by common ground. This, we are com this is what we have in common together. And then he makes his defense. And the point is, there's nothing wrong with making a defense. If someone misunderstands us, there's nothing wrong with making that, setting the record state straight and clarifying it. It's important to kind of know your own position in there, but it needs to be done with integrity and Christ-likeness. And so have you ever had to make a defense to clear up misunderstandings? I bet, I bet you have. We all have. And at times people have had to kind of clarify things for us. Or just maybe, just maybe at this moment at home or work or school or in the community or wherever, just maybe you feel a need to sort of make a defense and to clarify things with someone else in your own life. I would say there's nothing wrong with that. Let's just do that with integrity and let us do it with Christ-likeness. So how do, you deal when you're, how do you deal with it when you're misunderstood or misrepresented? We, we find commonality and then we, in Christ-likeness, we make a defense. And then number three, finally, we show humility. We show humility. Now, this particular point is going to take us beyond our reading, but it's still part of the larger context. So, as soon as Paul says to this audience, God sent me away to the Gentiles, the, um, the audience immediately erupts. They can't stand this idea that that God Almighty would send him to the uh, unclean Gentiles. A riot happens. A riot takes place. Paul is uh, drug in front of uh, the, the, tri the Roman Tribune. Soldiers have to surround him in order to protect him. And ultimately, he is brought once again before the people to make another case. And this is what happens, and this is a very important point. As Paul's standing there in front of the Jewish council, the Jewish high priest tells somebody to punch Paul in the mouth. Paul looks at the Jewish high priest and says, you whitewashed wall. You, know, you hypocrite. You are a hypocrite. And immediately, and the, the verses are going to go on the screen, look what happens. Somebody standing there says, verse 4, those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And look at Paul's answer. And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. This is very important. 
It's very important. Paul is struck in the mouth, or he's told to be struck in the mouth. Paul looks at the person who gave the order and says, you whitewashed wall. They say, he's the high priest. Who do you think you are talking about the high priest like that? And Paul goes, oh my, I didn't know he was the high priest. Paul understands that the law says you do not speak vile things against the high priest. Paul's like, my ba- I am wrong. Here's the point. Paul's defense was right, but he misstepped in this moment, and he owned it. He said, you know, I should not have done that. I think this is a great lesson. Even if you're misunderstood or misrepresented, even if maligned, there is a need for great humility. The ability to be able to say, I'm wrong if I'm wrong. Conflict makes this challenging because walking through conflict is like walking through a minefield. You ever walk through conflict? It's like walking through a minefield where every step can blow up on you. And it's not whether or not something might blow up. It's going to blow up sooner or later. And sometimes the blow up is because of something somebody else has done. Sometimes the blow up is because something you've done. And I think it's important to note that when we step and we blow something up, it's important to acknowledge it and just go, hey, my bad in this. My bad. I love Paul. He's right. His defense is right. But he goes, you know what? I was wrong in that particular moment. I have a a preacher friend. He's actually a district superintendent of another denomination, not a Methodist denomination. I I know preachers from all across the denominations and other denominations besides Methodists that use that term. But but when he asked how he can pray for for me, and, and this is what I would have said forever and this is a prayer that I think we all need I'm like pray that I will keep integrity pray that I keep integrity and he immediately responded he goes hey I want to give you my life verse and his life verse is Psalm 2521 and I love this 2521 Psalm may integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. I think there's a good verse for all of us. Because in the world of what it means to be human, being un- misunderstood and sometimes misunderstanding, there is a tremendous need to walk with integrity. Humility is really the picture that we get of Jesus. It really is the picture that we get of Jesus. However, Unlike Paul, who is humble over his own mistakes, Jesus humbles himself not because of his mistakes, but because of ours. Isn't that amazing? Unlike Paul, who humbles himself over Paul's mistake, Jesus humbles himself to the point of going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world, not for something he did wrong, but for our sins. And that's the picture that we get of Jesus at the Last Supper when he takes the bread and he says, this is my body, which is given for you. And this is my blood shed for you. Please join me in our liturgy for communion. Friends, this is the table of the Lord. From the night of his arrest through succeeding generations... Jesus' disciples have continued to come to the table for this holy meal. As he did that night in Jerusalem, so ever since, in all times and places, Christ meets us here. We are included in this feast, whether we are filled with faith or emptied by doubt, whether we are first among saints, last among scoundrels, or somewhere in between. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In bread broken and cup poured out, we remember the full extent of Christ's love for us and give thanks. Come, let us join the whole communion of saints as we keep this feast. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You sent your son Jesus for the healing of the world that we might learn to follow his life of humility and share in the joy of his glorious resurrection. And so we praise you and we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night before he died for us, Jesus gathered his friends for a meal. He took bread, gave you thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come in glory. Let us pray. Glorious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and juice that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we, his body redeemed by his blood, would be his body for the world in which we live. Bless these elements, we pray. Bless those who receive them, we pray. We love you, but you loved us first, and we never forget that. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite the Hethcoats to come forward. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So the table is. Oh, let me do this. Oops. Sorry. Amen. Thank you. The table is set. There's also a gluten-free station here if you would care, and if you come up, you can kind of serve yourself by taking the cracker from the plate. But um, Just as the Lord leads, if you'll come from this side, you're invited. If you'd like to pray about anything, I'd love to pray with you over on the side.
thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness is still in your hands this is my confidence. You never fail me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me yet. Let's sing this together
stand for the benediction? When misunderstood, when in the midst of conflict, may we find common ground. May we with integrity clarify, but also may we show humility when wrong. Go forth from this place knowing that we serve the King the one who was perfect and yet he laid down his life for the sins of the world. Know that, believe that, know that you are loved more than you can even imagine. Go forth in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. See you next week. Watching the time just ticking Clock runs around days in and I can't really call it living Somewhere I let light go dark But here's where my new story starts Take my life and let it be Set on fire for all to see Break me down, baby